All right, so where we stopped, we were just about to start prolactin, but I wanted to review where we were. So we are talking about the anterior pituitary. This is the structure that is a traditional endocrine tissue. However, it works with the hypothalamus. So as we're going through all of the anterior pituitary hormones, um, because this is the chapter on the endocrine system, each story revolves around the anterior pituitary, but the hypothalamus is actually the beginning of each story. So it's a little weird um, to sort of with each anterior pituitary hormone, you need to first consider how the hypothalamus controls its release. So generally speaking, you have neurons in the hypothalamus that monitor different bodily processes. In response to that, they release different regulatory hormones, which pass through this portal vein and hit the anterior pituitary and then regulate the release of hormones from the anterior pituitary. So this, there we go, is the whole list. I don't know if we're doing them in this order or not. I forget. Um, I think so. We stop at thyroid hormone and then use that as our jumping point off to talk about the thyroid gland and everything else. Um, so I just want to point out what's going to happen is we're going to talk about prolactin first because the general method of regulating prolactin is different than the others. But then all, how many other, five other ones all have the same basic structure of feedback loop. Um, which means any one of them could be an essay question on the exam. And this is a longer, almost a paragraph type of essay question. I couldn't figure out a way to break these up into smaller questions. Um, so it's a lot to learn, but I'll promise that you'll only have to type one. Uh, so let's talk about prolactin first. Um, first, what you want to know is what prolactin does. It causes the mammillary glands to start producing milk. Um, and because this is a only a few times in a lifetime event and kind of happens at specific, only during pregnancy in, the, in these very specific times, it's not regulated in the same fashion as a lot of other hormones, which are part of your day-to-day -day existence. Um, so under non-pregnant, non-lactating circumstances, um, the hypothalamus is going to release prolactin inhibiting hormone, which is actually just dopamine, and that prevents the anterior pituitary from making prolactin. Then during pregnancy, some stimulus from the uterus or the placenta lets the hypothalamus know that it is time to start producing milk. That signal is what causes the hypothalamus to start making PRH or prolactin releasing hormone. This is going to stimulate uh, milk production. And then whenever you have suckling, that creates kind of a positive feedback loop or just keeps the PRH coming. So there's a signal from the reproductive system somewhere that says start making PRH and then you will continue to make PRH as long as you are nursing. Um, and I will also point out there are a lot of acronyms here um, so it might not be a bad idea just to make flashcards for the acronyms so that you can memorize them all because um, I just have a habit of always saying the acronyms and students sometimes get lost. Um, so then um, all of the other hormones, the other five, all have the same basic regulatory mechanism. There is going to be a hormone from the hypothalamus that travels to the anterior pituitary that causes something to be released from the anterior pituitary. That hormone is going to hit a distant sort of end product endocrine gland, which will then in response response release another hormone, that hormone or some other consequence of, um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, 
the uh, pituitary hormone release, some consequence of this release is going to feed back on the hypothalamus and make sure that you don't have too much, usually negative feedback. Uh, but you're going to see there is one exception to that. Um, so this is why I'm only going to ask you about one of all of these because they all basically have the same plot but with just different characters. Um, so first up then is the one we just saw a picture of which is adrenocorticotropic hormone. So you want to know that adrenocorticotropic hormone stimulates the adrenal cortex to release glucocorticoids. We will go over what glucocorticoids are and what they do later. For now, just know that sort of the most popular glucocorticoid is cortisol, and that's what we're going to think of as coming out of the adrenal cortex when ACTH hits it. So the way it's regulated, um, and I left myself room to draw here, right? So remember, we're going to start with the hypothalamus. That is going to release what is called CRH, corticotropin releasing hormone. That is going to travel to the pituitary. That's supposed to be a pit. And cause the pituitary to make a CTH. This is going to travel to the adrenal cortex. There we go. Um, and you'll notice, I should have pointed this out before, right? Adrenocorticotropic hormone. Anytime you see tropic, um, that means stimulating. So adrenocorticotropic hormone stimulates the adrenal cortex. So it's going to stimulate the adrenal cortex to release our friend cortisol. And then cortisol is going to negatively feed back on the hypothalamus. So unfortunately on the exam, you can't draw me these nifty little diagrams. You have to use sentences, but this diagram is what you want to be able to put into sentence form. Uh, so again, the hypothalamus releases corticotropin releasing hormone, which travels to the pituitary, causing the release of adrenocorticotropic hormone. Adrenocorticotropic hormone goes everywhere, but when it hits the adrenal cortex, the cells that have receptors for it, the cells in the adrenal cortex release cortisol. Cortisol goes everywhere, does ev lots of things, which we will talk about later. But when it hits the hypothalamus, it causes a decrease in CRH, right? Negatively feeds back on the hypothalamus, so cortisol levels don't keep going up. Um, next up are the gonadotropins, FSH and LH. We consider them together because they are regulated together. So they're both part of the same feedback loop regulatory mechanism. Don't worry about what they do for now. We're going to have a whole chapter for the reproductive system. Um, I will say the one thing that you want to remember is what luteinizing hormone does is because it causes the production of these gonadal hormones and that's going to be part of the feedback loop. So when we go through it, it's luteinizing hormone that I'm going to focus on, but FSH is going along for the ride too. Okay then. How does, how is the release of LH and FSH, our anterior pituitary hormones, how is that regulated and controlled? So again, right, we're always starting with the hypothalamus. I'm just going to write an H. The hypothalamus will receive some sort of signal like leptin or hor some hormone from your body to tell you it is time to enter puberty. That is going to cause it to make GnRH or gonadotropin releasing hormone, which is going to travel to the pituitary and it will cause the pituitary to release gonadotropins, LH and FSH. Um, so let's just write LH, right? But they both get released. They go everywhere, but one of their targets is the gonads, which is the generic term for ovaries and testes, so the male and female reproductive organs. Um, and then the gonads are going to produce testosterone in males. 
and the one we care about is estrogen in females then there's going to be feedback onto the hypothalamus um, and here it is sometimes positive feedback sometimes negative feedback so if you get this question on the exam just say that the gonadal hormones testosterone and estrogen feed back on the hypothalamus and control the release of gonadotropin releasing hormone um, so that is the story of LH and FSH. Now we are on to growth hormone. Um, and I think the first thing we're going to do is just cover the regulation of growth hormone uh, and then go into its effects. But growth hormone gets a little bit complicated. You'll see why in a second. So again, we're starting, of course, with the hypothalamus that is going to produce growth hormone releasing hormone which will travel to the pituitary and in response the pituitary is going to produce growth hormone. Um, growth hormone has a lot of effects on the body but one in particular that we care about is it causes the liver to produce what are called insulin-like growth factors or IGFs. Um, that's on this page here, um, but we are stuck here. Then for feedback, um, both growth hormone and IGFs negatively feed back on the hypothalamus and cause it to make growth hormone inhibiting hormone which is then going to block the production of growth hormone. So you've got a couple extra wrinkles that are thrown into the same basic mechanism. Uh, you've got both the pituitary and the end product hormone feeding back on the hypothalamus and now the existence of this inhibitory hormone that comes from the hypothalamus to shut down the pituitary. Um, while we are talking about growth hormone, um, you want to know the effects that it has on the body. So it has direct effects and indirect effects. Whoops, um, I got ahead of myself. So directly what it does is it hits the liver and in the liver it stimulates the production of insulin-like growth factors that we saw already. And then in the rest of the body, think mostly muscle and bone, um, it is causing fat breakdown and an increase in blood glucose. Um, so the way you want to think about this is that growth is a long-term process that requires energy. So what your body is doing is tapping your long-term energy stores, which is what fat is, and burning the fat to make glucose, which is going to what's which is going to be what actually fuels the growth. And then the growth is actually mediated by the insulin-like growth factors. So these then, um, mitosis and bone and cartilage and protein synthesis and muscle, those are the indirect effects of growth hormone. Growth hormone causes insulin-like growth factors to be released, and then the insulin-like growth factors actually cause the growth. So Direct and indirect effects are not part of the essay question. It's just being able to explain this messy little diagram. Um, but you do want to be able to answer true, false, multiple choice type questions about direct effects and indirect effects of growth hormone. Um, and as I already said, this is part of the um, diagram, insulin-like growth factors and growth hormone feedback on the hypothalamus and cause the production of growth hormone inhibiting hormone. So that's all there. Um, this is a figure which I will not spend much time on, but you could use as a good review exercise. Um, human beings are very visual animals. Our visual cortex is the biggest part of our sensory cortex. Um, so we are literally built to interpret and remember our world in a visual format. So as much as you can take advantage of diagrams, do so. Even if you're answering questions using sentences, 
diagrams help you remember the information. Even if I ask a question that's all in sentences, the diagram will still help you answer that text question. Okay, now we are on to thyroid stimulating hormone, this one right here. So this is our anterior pituitary hormone. Um, it is sometimes also called thyrotropin. Um, you are going to see later when we talk about abbreviations, it doesn't matter which you call it because the first letter is still T here or whoops, lost my stylus, T there. Um, so when it comes to thyroid hormone, here we are again at our friend, the hypothalamus. It is going to produce what is called TRH, which stands for TSH releasing hormone or thyrotropin releasing hormone. I always just call TSH TSH and not thyrotropin because I find it easier. Um, so the hypothalamus is going to produce TSH releasing hormone, which is going to travel to the pituitary. And the pituitary in response is going to make TSH, which is thyroid stimulating hormone. That is going to travel to the thyroid, which is going to make thyroid hormones. That's a pathetic H, thyroid hormones. Then there's a wrinkle here. The thyroid hormones negatively feed back at both the hypothalamus and pituitary. Presumably this is because thyroid hormone acts very quickly. It is a short-term metabolic regulatory hormone, so you need to have very fine control over its release, and this just gives your body finer control over its release. And I don't really know if that's why it happened, but it makes sense to me if I frame it that way. Um, so again, hypothalamus is going to release thyrotropin releasing hormone or TSH releasing hormone. TSH releasing hormone goes to the pituitary, causes the release of TSH. TSH will go everywhere when it hits the thyroid. It stimulates the thyroid to produce thyroid hormones, which then negatively feed back onto both the pituitary and the hypothalamus. Um, so I hope that makes sense. This is all the same thing here, um, only I wanted to be consistent and keep drawing my goofy little diagrams. Uh, so now we are out of the anterior pituitary um, and into our first um, peripheral endocrine organ, the thyroid gland. Uh, this here is what the thyroid gland looks like under the microscope, probably with your 10x objective. Um, each one of these little circular things here is called a follicle. The follicle contains a substance called colloid. All I want you to know about the thyroid gland from this slide is that this colloid is a combination of protein and iodine, and this is what your thyroid gland processes to produce thyroid hormone. So this is your raw material for making thyroid hormone. Um, so there are actually two thyroid hormones that come out of your thyroid gland. Those hormones are called T4 and T3. That is all you ever need to be able to say or write. I will not ask you to write tetraiodothyronine or even thyroxine or triiodothyronine. Um, I would not expect that you would ever see these uh, chemical diagrams on the exam, but I just like to explain it because it's fun. This is our friend tyrosine. Tyrosine is an amino acid. So what your thyroid gland does is clip tyrosines off of the colloid protein and combine it with iodine with some modification to make these two hormones. So what happens is the gland starts with two tyrosine molecules and it chops, what does it do? It chops this part off of one of them right here. Um, then imagine just this part like this down here attached to the tail end of an intact tyrosine. So here's tyrosine with its um, alpha carbon still attached and its carboxylic acid and amino group. And then on the other end of this tyrosine, it just has 
um, the tyrosyl ring or this ring structure from the other tyrosine now with iodines substituted on it. This by the way is if you read your salt label carefully it says iodized. We all need thyroid hormone and we need iodine to manufacture it. Um, there is not a uniform distribution of thyroid hormone in the soil throughout the world. So what public health experts have done is said, hey, let's just iodinate our salt. We like to put salt in things. And then simply by eating salt that everybody craves, everybody will have enough iodine and will solve what could be a global health crisis. Um, and it's worked. So you know what? Listen to your global health experts. They're experts for a reason. Um, next up then, what do we want to know? You want to know that most of what comes out of your thyroid gland is T4. It is the major product of the gland. However, T3 is the more active form of the hormone. This means it is better at binding to the target receptors. It is 10 times stickier than T4. Um, and the way I think of it then is that, um, does it say it? Oh yeah, enzymes convert T4 to T3 in tissues as it circulates. So what T4 actually represents, as it says here, is a reservoir of hormone that circulates throughout the body. And then when tissues need T3, um, they can generate their own T3 from circulating T4 locally. So it's a way to um, geogra geographically control the levels of active thyroid hormone. So only certain tissues are getting the T3 that's stimulating their metabolism. As I said, here it is right here. This is what thyroid hormone does. It is, as it says right here, your major metabolic hormone. We are just going to think of it in adults as regulating your metabolic rate. Um, so if thyroid hormone levels go up, your metabolic rate goes up. If thyroid hormone levels go down, your metabolic rate goes down. Simply think of it that way. It does play other roles, but we don't have time to get into it. And in fetuses, in infants, it is an absolute requirement for brain development. So it has these two very different roles, um, metabolism in adults and neural development in uh fetuses and newborns. Uh, so, and this is, yeah, we'll, I'll just move right along. I, I could talk more about thyroid hormone because it's what I went to graduate school for, but I, we don't have time. Um, so we do want to know homeostatic imbalances of thyroid hormone. We are going to go over some of the pathological conditions associated with some of these hormones. So first up is hyposecretion. If you do not make enough thyroid hormone. Um, in adults, this leads to, um, and I should say this is just adults, um, it leads to mental sluggishness, weight gain, and fatigue because your thyroid hormone levels are low and you get this big swelling of your thyroid gland called the goiter. So what's happening there is that because your thyroid hormone levels are chronically low, your pituitary is being stimulated by your hypothalamus, right? So TRH levels are high, which means TSH levels are high. So your hypothalamus and your pituitary are trying to boost your thyroid hormone levels, but your thyroid gland simply cannot make thyroid hormone for one reason or another. Um, and in response to elevated TSH levels over many, many years, the gland just starts getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and you develop a goiter. Um, so your thyroid is huge, but it's not producing any thyroid hormone. Um, again, in adults, if you have too much, this is called Graves' disease. It is an autoimmune disease. Um, and here it's just the opposite now. Um, your metabolism speeds up, so you're going to get weight loss and sweating. It also affects your mental functions, only now instead of being kind of sluggish, because your metabolism is sluggish, it's a little bit like having ADHD. You have trouble focusing. Uh, your mind is racing a bit because your metabolism has sped up. And you also get these bulging eyes, 
which are not super apparent in this picture here, um, but this was the only non-copyrighted picture I could find of somebody with exophthalmus. Um, so there you go. Then in the fetus or a child, it is a different story. Um, as far as I know, hyperthyroidism, too much thyroid hormone, not a problem in fetuses or infants. And if it is a problem, it's just like in adults and they treat it and, and you're fine. Um, hyposecretion though, if as a fetus or an infant, um, you have decreased thyroid hormone levels, if untreated, this can lead to sometimes severe permanent cognitive defects. Um, and if you are truly hypothyroid, no to very little hypothyroidism throughout gestation and childhood, you will develop this full suite of characteristics called cretinism, again with the cognitive deficits and shortness of stature. So this is, I don't know how old this person is supposed to be, but this person is an adult. They are about the size of maybe an eight-year-old child. Um, and this person had um, permanent cognitive deficits, um, digestive system problems, and short and all sorts of other problems. Um, so that's cretinism, and that's what happens if you don't have enough thyroid hormone when you are growing up. All right, so now we are still in the thyroid gland, and we are talking about a completely unrelated hormone. Don't ask me how that happens. Um, called calcitonin. You may remember calcitonin from the chapter on bones because it regulates blood calcium levels. You want to remember that its job is to make the blood calcium levels proper. Um, it does not serve the skeleton. It serves the bloodstream. Um, so if your blood calcium levels are elevated, calcitonin is going to be released and it is going to cause your Oh yeah, your osteoclasts, I read that wrong already, um, to slow down. So it inhibits, inhibits your osteoclasts, will stimulate your osteoblasts. So you're going to be adding density to your bones or making more osteoid and storing this excess calcium in your bones. That lowers your blood calcium levels. Um, Presumably, people generally don't have a big problem with too much calcium in their diet. So not having calcitonin in your body is not a big deal. And this is why it says it doesn't really have an important role. Um, one would imagine if humo humans had a habit of eating lots of calcium, like chewing on the bones of other animals, we might need some calcitonin. Uh, then you have your parathyroid glands. Um, associated with the thyroid gland. So there are one, two, three, four little parathyroid glands on the back of your thyroid hormone that secrete parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone is the antagonistic partner to thyroid hormone. Um, so if your blood calcium levels are low, parathyroid hormone is going to be released to increase your blood calcium levels. So it's going to stimulate your osteoclasts. They are going to chew up your bone and release calcium into the bloodstream. It also stimulates your kidneys to keep as much calcium as possible in your bloodstream by pulling it out of the urine and it increases calcium reabsorption in your digestive tract. So that is the thyroid and all of the hormones that come out of it. And we are going to stop there because this is starting to get long and I have a meeting in 15 minutes. Uh, so stay tuned for Endocrine System Part 3.